once again. All right, what we're going to do tonight is do a uh, lesson for beginners, essentially, but it's good for all of us because I think some of the things I'm going to present are things we all need to think about. And so I've renamed this art, this uh, lesson a little bit and calling it preparing to work with patrons. And then we'll also talk a little bit about finding where we can go and tree to easily, most easily find new relatives to add to our tree. So it's time to meet with our patrons. So we need to do some planning. And I think we need to start by understanding what our charge is. And I, I really thought this was interesting that uh, the church has a whole section in their ministering area on churchofjesuschrist.org labeled minister through temple and family history. And that is really true with what we do. This is what we are doing when we serve as consultants. And so, you know, this is just one of the many ways that we can minister. And like it says here, even something small can have a profound effect. And this is the kind of thing that we are hoping to have when we work with our various patrons. You know, as we pray for guidance, we want to remember the power of te temple and family history work to build a testimony and to heal relationships and families. And so this is one of the things that often we kind of forget about as we focus on the family history side of it or the temple side of it, and we kind of forget about the personal side of it and the way this can change the people's lives. I've left the link down on the bottom to where you can find this particular web page. Now on that page, it talks about, actually there's like nine little windows here that you can click on to go to, but it essentially is talking about the philosophy of ministering to our members and talking about the way we minister, the outcomes we hope for, like blessing others through family history or ministering to families with fun discovery activities to get their interest and meet them on their level, simple ways to find ordinances for the temple, helping parents and youth prepare for the temple, learning about your family, helping others to build family connections. These are all portals to a whole group of articles and presentations and different things that you can look at and explore. Some of them you might want to share with your patrons. And so this is really an excellent page to help us to get the mindset that we really want to have, that our job's not just to do family history work, but to help change lives. And that's really what we're trying to do when we go into a person's home, is to make them a little bit better, to make them a little closer to our Father in heaven, and to maybe hopefully open their eyes to a little bit more of the gospel and its impact, both on this side of the veil and the other side. Okay, so how do we go about this ministry that we're going to participate in? Well, going all the way back to 2016, which is now six years ago, um, the church first introduced what they called Find, Take, Teach, which was a new approved way of teaching family history. The thing that was really uh, revolutionary in this was the fact that this was a one-on-one -on -one instruction program which they asked us to replace the old group teaching system with this one-on-one -on -one instruction. And they promised us that if we did this, that things would change, that we would see great changes. And we know that prior to, to COVID, at least in our stake, that the percentage of people that were submitting grew from like 5% on the average, which was about the church average, 2 to 5% of the members in a normal year submitting names to over 28% of our stake submitting names. So as we implemented this, we saw 
that it really did work. And so this one-on-one -on -one program is what the church is still supporting in our ministry and the way they would like to see us minister. And so the, you know, the key to our actions is to teach to the needs of our members. That's the other thing. We have maybe an agenda of our own, at least a portion of one or a small one that we'd like to see everybody take their own names to the temple. But beyond that, I think we need to realize that we need to meet the needs of our patrons and to try to identify what is it they would like to get from this experience. Okay, back in 2016, Mike Sandberg, who is a church employee and he's a product manager over uh, youth in family search. He's, his main job is to develop programs and things that the youth would find interesting. And this is what he had to say back in 2016. He says, as part of this find, take, teach process, family history, consultants and helpers worldwide learn to apply a set of proven principles to create heart-turning experiences for those they work with. These experiences help others love family history and ultimately become saviors on Mount Zion. This is exactly what we hope to have happen when we go out to meet with our patrons, our various ward members that have asked us, invited us to come into their homes. Okay, they, let, they, they developed a set of steps that we need to consider and go through as we're preparing a lesson to take to our patrons. And these steps essentially are this. First, contact your patron and learn their goals and wants. Secondly, to prepare spiritually, because this really is a spiritual experience. Get access to their family search account so that you can be their helper and see what they have in their tree. Search their family tree before you meet them so that when you go to meet them, you, the first time you actually can have something to provide them. And prepare a, bait, a lesson based on their needs and wants. And then include an invite to them to complete the temple ordinances of their relatives if you find them or provide them through ordinances ready or something like that and then invite them to share this new knowledge that you're helping them with to others, either inside their family or outside their family. So these are the seven basic steps that we wanna go through when we're preparing a lesson. And so what we'll do is just briefly go through these, starting with a personal contact. You know, when you first come, contact the person, make sure they understand that you're a temple and family history consultant. And what you want to do is find out what they would like to learn from you, explain that you'll prepare a lesson for them and set a date where you can get together and it can either be in person or over the internet at church, whatever, you know, works, whatever works for the two of you will be fine. And thank them for their willingness to engage in family history. In the conversation, you might want to mention that, at least in our stake, the bishops and the stake presidency have a, a goal that they would like that they everybody should try to take a name their na own names to the temple. So you can tell them you're there on the stake president and the bishop's errand. And the main part of that errand is to take names to the temple. But beyond that, you're there to do whatever they're interested in. Secondly, prepare spiritually. That means on your own before you meet with them and when you meet with them. Have a prayer and, and invite the spirit to come in. And remember that uh, we're trying to change people's hearts. And so as we do things, we want to be inspired by our Heavenly Father to go to things or prepare things that will touch the heart of our patron. And we won't get that unless we actually seek for that. But if you do that, I promise you, you'll have more effective lessons with your patrons. Okay, get access to their 
account. Now there's two main ways you can do that. First is you can go to the helper resources. You go to the little question mark in family search and click on helper resources and up comes the resources page where you can add somebody into your planner, into your helper resources. And when you add that person in, you then are able to access their account. And you can get into this, you know, by clicking helper resources. This will be on the right hand side of the page. You can click on add someone. And if they're in your ward or stake, you'll be able to pull them up through tools and it'll send them an invite or you can just fill out an email form and it will send the invite to there. Or you could copy the invite link and then send it to somebody through a text message or another a private email or whatever to get it to them. And then if they respond to it, then you become their helper and they're listed in your planner. And this is a good way to go because once you've done it, all you have to do from there on is go to the helper resources and there'll be a list of people you're helping and click on their name and you're automatically in their account. The other option is to use the old fashioned uh, helper little tool that's at the top of the page in family search. And if you click on that, you have two ways you can help them, either through their username and their helper number or their full name, birth date and helper number. And so there's two different ways to do that. The, the drawback with this one is you have to enter this information each time you go into tree and want to help them and see their stuff. It's a lot more effective to come over here into the uh, helper resources and get access to their account. And there's actually more things you can see about them if you're in the helper resources. So once you have access, now you're able to go see their tree. And then you're in helper resources, you'll see that there are discovery ideas that you can see for this person. They'll have like discovery activities and they'll have lists of people who have uh, hints and other people that need temple work, things like that. They'll have their tree, which is what you see on the screen right now. There's a place where you can take notes that are for you to view. And then there's also a place here in the in the helper resources where you can actually do a lesson plan for the people. And so these things are all available for you in the helper resources. And it really does speed things up when you're trying to prepare things for them to have this available. And I really do like the lesson plan thing there because then you don't have to worry about where did I stick that piece of paper because it's right there in, in the helper resources and you won't lose it. You can always print it out and give a copy to the patron if you want, keep one for you. So those are the helper resources that you can go to when you're preparing a lesson. The other thing that's nice about that helper resources is when you are on their tree, if you want to go explore their actual tree, it takes you right into their tree as if you are the patron. So when you're looking at their tree here, you can click on one of the little boxes. It'll tell you who it is. And then you, you know, if you click on person or tree, it takes you right into family search and it'll tell you right here that you are their helper. Now that's one thing you need to remember that if you do this and then you quit helping them and you don't exit out of family search and you go off to do your own work, you're still gonna be helping them. So you might wanna remember that you'll need to X this out so that you're no longer their helper or the things you put in are gonna be put in under their name, not your name. 
if you start working on your own things. And it's, it's really nice the way this is set up to allow you to interface with their materials and then get into their tree just really quickly. And um, we'll talk a little later about what I've developed is the easy system for going into the tree and helping find where we likely can find new names for the people that are, you know, trying to develop their tree and get names to take to the temple without just using ordinances ready. Okay, and then the preparing of an actual lesson. I, I've really found this to be valuable because I find a lot of times I go through and I do research and I find this and that and I find this source. And if I don't write all this stuff down and really have it quantified, when I try to get back with the patron, I'm going to forget what I'm doing. And so it can be a real problem. Keep a lesson short. Try to consider that you're probably going to want to not overstay your stay. So a 30 minute lesson is probably the max. Try to keep it very simple. This is just an example of a lesson for somebody. We'll go through this process in a couple of months with an actual lesson. We'll take you from you know, step zero to the end of the lesson and go through that and develop one for you. Okay. Once you've gotten that far, you want to remember that you're going to want to invite them to complete those ordinances. Everything we do is geared towards trying to provide ordinances for the departed ancestors of ours. And if we're not doing that, then we're not really with the program the way the Lord would like to have it. So, you know, do everything you can to encourage the patrons to actually print the cards or share them with the temple. And if they print the cards to actually take them to the temple so that they can participate in this and have these life-changing experiences that can occur when they actually do take their own names to the temple. And then the last thing is something that we often forget about, and that's to invite to share these new skills with people. And a lot of times you don't meet with the whole family. You might just meet with the, the husband or the wife. And once you train them, the goal is to have them start training the other people in their home or any of their friends or family that are interested in this. This is a way to grow the basic program of family history without us as paid consultants having to do all the work. Teach them how to fish and then have them teach others how to fish is essentially the idea. So these are the things you want to go through and think about as you're preparing to do a lesson with whatever patron, whichever patron you're going to work with. Now, does this really make a difference? Well, this is what they found starting back in 2016. The church, of course, has ways to monitor things that we could never do. And they know exactly what members of the church have submitted names, how often they have submitted, how many names they've submitted. They know more about us than we'd like to know about ourselves. What they learned after they got the Find Take Teach program going was that 85% of the people who were submitting, they went and sent out surveys to these people who were submitters and said, just answer a couple questions for us. One of them is, have you had a helper come work with you? And 85% of the people who were submitters said yes. They did have a helper who had taken them by the hand and shown them a little something. And then they also found that 65% of those people had received multiple visits from the consultant. And so it really shows the effect and the importance of having consultants and using them to meet with the members. And what I like to do is try to see within our ward, at least, that the consultant, once you meet with somebody, they become your patron. And then over time, you can go back to them and say, hey, how are things going? 
do we need to meet again? Is there something else you'd like to learn about and things like that so that they know who they can turn to and that they have a real assigned person to help them. Most of these people don't require much help once you get them going, but I think it is nice for them to know that there's somebody they can turn to if they need further help. Okay. Along came the year 2018, doesn't seem possible four years ago that Ordinances Ready came along. And that really was a game changer. It uh, made things super, super easy to take names to the temple. Uh, the brethren, I don't think quite appreciated the fact that we really do need to be careful and go through and check these people you know, if you're provided with names to take for baptisms or endowments, you really ought to take a little glance at them and tree and make sure for yourself that you feel comfortable with taking that name to the temple. Because sometimes the human eye will see things that the computer doesn't. The computer will think this person's perfectly fine and the human eye might say, I am not so sure about that. And so it is good to look there because what tends to happen is if you don't do that, a lot of the people really don't connect very well with these people they're taking. It's just like getting a name at the temple. It's just that you picked it up a little earlier and hopefully it's your family, but it's still, you're not really getting that good connection. That's why if we can slow our patrons down just a little bit and at least have them look these people over before they take them to the temple, I think you'll be able to do that connecting with the with the names, the names of the people that they're taking to the temple. Now, like I say, make sure you check them for accuracy and things like that. And, you know, some people, like I said here on the bottom, some people, uh, this is all they want. And that's fine. If they don't want to get involved in research, then don't force them. But there'll be other people that would still like to learn something about how to do research. And that's the person that we're, we're kind of gearing our lessons towards, at least these lessons, where we talk a little bit about doing research itself. Larry, your uh, microphone is working. You might want to mute yourself. Okay. Now, the second half of this lesson, the last part of this lesson is just a, a little something that I developed a few years ago that went along with this as far as trying to help people and figuring out where to go to find these cousins that we might be able to add. Some of us can add ancestors. That's true. That's kind of a given. I'll use a play on my own name. For those that don't have extensive pedigrees, you're going to want to find your ancestors. But for most of us, a majority of us, we're looking at cousins. If we're going to add people in tree that need temple work, we're going to have to find the aunts and uncles and cousins that haven't been put in tree yet. And so I kind of developed a program that works. And this works, especially this is geared towards the United States. So the parameters might change a little bit if your patron doesn't have United States ancestry, but in general, the principles are basically the same. Ultimately, to find people to add into tree, we're probably gonna wanna mine what I call the golden 1800s. This is the most fertile ground where we can find missing people to add into tree. They're the closest people to us that don't fall in the 110 year rule where they have to be our immediate family members. So we can go up to the year 1912 right now and people born prior to that will be able to submit without having to be a close relative. This is a good area to mine for people, to search for people, because this is an area with an abundance of records, census records, marriage records, death records, burial records, church records. People born in that time period lived longer oftentimes into the 1900s where they do fall into death certificates and 
they fall in censuses. They come up in censuses and they're found in burial records, which lead us back to their birth information and hopefully to their parents. And so what we're really after is to find people that fall in that category of being born somewhere after 1800 or around 1800 up to about 1912. Now, to locate where we're going to physically actually look for these people, we want to go back in our tree. And if we're an old LDS family, we're going to want to go back beyond our earliest church members in our family. Because once they've joined the church, and they're, you know, they have descendants. These people have been picked over and picked over and picked over by the family, because if they didn't join the church, the rest of the family members really honed in on those families right away. So you're not going to find much for the descendants of members of the church. And so you're going to want to go back in time to before they joined the church, because up until recently, the real focus of the church was to do your ancestors. And so the descendants of our ancestors going in time before the family joined the church didn't often get covered near as much. And so what you want to do is to go back in time a couple of generations prior to the time that you, your family joined the church and start there looking at the descendants of those people because you'll have a better chance of running into places where the tree hasn't really been fully grown yet. Now, how are you going to know if people join the church? Okay, I've taken flack on this before, but I still hold to it that the majority of the members of the church that are in tree have an ID number that starts with KW. Not everybody, but I'd say 90% of the early members of the church, and even you and I, have an ID that starts with KW. Some of them start with K2. And there's a few other things, but that's one way. If you just look at your pedigree, if you have old LDS lines, you can almost follow the KWIDs back up a tree and know exactly where the church began. Now, there's other things you can do. Obviously, you can look at the people's uh, ordinance records. And baptisms, though, for early members are not real accurate. The membership records weren't always kept but the other temple work is and so if you see people who were endowed while they were still alive obviously they were members or baptized when they were still alive the other thing would be where did these people live if they die in utah or idaho or nauvoo or far west you can pretty well assume they were probably members of the church for the you know most part so there's several different ways to identify your ancestors, if they were members or not. And so if I figure out where the earliest ones were and go back a couple of generations, and this will take you probably to people born in the uh, somewhat early 1700s. Now, you don't want to go back any further than you have to, because I'll tell you, every generation you go back and tree, you open yourself up for more problems with bad records and bad relationships and things like that. So you do have to be a little bit careful about that. Okay, once you've done that, now you're ready to come down the other direction. You've gone back to a certain ancestor. Now you need to find their descendants. And there's a couple of different ways we can do this. One is with a tool that's found right in family search, the descendancy view. So you take that ancestor that you want to begin with and you change from their pedigree to their descent and you start working down that descent. We'll do a whole lesson where we do nothing but talk about how to use the descendancy view to help us find people where we can probably use the hints to add new names into tree. And it's really not that hard. It's not like we have to go out and do a lot of digging around. We'll let the 
the system and the hinting system, which is generally pretty accurate, to help us develop a list of new names of people that we can add into tree. The other way to do it for finding our cousins is to use what's called Bazilla third party product. And we'll also do a lesson on that and show you how we can use Bazilla to do the same basic thing of coming down through the descendancy, looking for places where we can add new relatives. And when we add new relatives, those are people generally that need temple work. And so this, this is basically the system that I've developed. It seems to work pretty good. And so um, yeah, I would suggest that if you aren't familiar with doing cousin research, that you do a little on your own and play around. If you don't have Bazilla, the Bazilla program, which you can, there's a free version of it, you can download on your own machine and play with it. You definitely can do the descendancy chart and family search and have it take you down through the descendants of somebody and see if you can find places where there are people that either have green temples or if you use the hints, you start adding new names to people. Okay. Just try to remember all that we're doing. Our goal is to help others to love family history. And that will happen when they get their hands wet and dirty and start playing around in family search. And so this is our goal, which is to try to help turn their hearts by involving them in family search. And the next lesson that we have in the beginner strand We'll actually, like I say, go through an actual lesson and show you how to set it up, all the steps from start to finish. Okay, that's our presentation tonight. I hope that uh, it's helped you get some ideas. Let me turn off the recording.